I will I will tell you that we start streaming because it will be okay. online. Okay. Okay. Sure. Professor Khalid Hussaini, good morning. Good morning, Professor Badri. Good morning. You good hear? morning. Okay. I will make a start with a small introduction, and then we can start according to the, the time plan that we have it. Okay? Okay. So, good morning, sure. uh, everyone. Good morning, uh, our guest speaker. Welcome to the plenary session for the second day of our conference with Faculty of Management Science at the third international conference concerning resilience and sustainability. I'm thrilled to see you today and uh, to share with you the one of the top expertise across our board, across the globe, as we embark on what uh, promises to be enlightened and impactful decisions and discussions. Today, we have a distinguished lineup of speakers who will share their insights on critical topics that shape our understanding of sustainability in various contexts. From net zero transition in Africa and Asia to sustainability businesses practice in Asia, each presentation will contribute to our collective knowledge, sparking new ideas and collaboration. So I will start by the first speakers, Professor Dr. Badri from India. He is from the government of India as a non-resident fellow, where he previously headed the, the, the Trade and Commerce Strategy Economic Dialogue, International Cooperation for the Vision of India 2047. Uh, Professor Badri simultaneously holds several affiliations, and he is a faculty member with the University of Washington, Seattle, Oregon State, University of Boston College, non-resident center senior fellow with the European Center of International Political Economy, Brussels National Council for Applied Economic Research, and Center for Social Economic Progress. He has been engaged with the startup communities across the world and is an advisor and co-founder. He had founded a consultancy firms in 2015, which has a global presence in different places across the globe. 
and he is reputed in many journals such as Nature, Communication, Energy Communities, Economics Network, and Spatial, Spatial Economics and Economic Model. So Professor Badri today is going to start his presentation and it is titled Net Zero Transition, Decarbonization, Trade, and Economic Development in Africa and Asia. Good morning, Professor. Good morning, uh, Dr. Dua. Thank you so much for uh, having me here. It uh, gives me a lot of pleasure to be uh, part of this uh, wonderful forum. Uh, so I'll be uh, talking about decarbonization and uh, its economic impact, uh, focusing on um, a couple of studies uh, that I conducted with some other colleagues. Uh, one was uh, focusing on uh, Southeast Asia, and the other one was focusing on uh, Middle East and North Africa. So that's why uh, it covers both Asia and Africa. So there are two different studies. So uh, I know the time is also relatively short, so uh, please bear with me for trying to uh, cover a lot of different uh, topics, a lot of different uh, details within a short time. Uh, but let me uh, try to uh, do some justice to this. So that the two uh, different topics that, that, that I'm going to cover, uh, uh, the first one is about uh, decarbonization in the the Middle East and North Africa, particularly focusing on the fossil, fossil fuel energy importing countries in the, within the Middle East and North Africa region. And, and I'm also going to talk about uh, Southeast Asia as a whole. So let me start with Southeast Asia. So the uh, we know that uh, many countries in the world, pretty much all the countries in the world have come up with uh, net zero transition uh, strategies. They're all trying to reduce their uh, carbon emissions uh, by uh, 2030 uh, based on the Paris Agreement and also by 2050, 2060, 2070, depending on the various countries. Each country has come up with its own uh, net zero transition plan. So now we focus on the, the 2030 plan for uh, Paris Agreement and the impact of the uh, you know uh, emissions reduction on the the economic parameters and the global value chain parameters of the uh, uh, members of uh, association for southeast uh, asian uh, nations asean so we look at uh, macro implications macroeconomic implications sectoral assessments then we look at the potential for renewables and then we look at the various supply chain parameters so we use a particular modeling framework. It's called uh, CGE or Computable General Equilibrium Modeling. Uh, so uh, since we have uh, an audience from various uh, different uh, disciplines and uh, areas of interest, I won't get into the deeply technical details of these models. But I'll just tell you broadly that these models um, uh, help us uh, pursue some kind of systems approach in terms of modeling, we look at uh, the linkages between various industries, various countries, various sectors, consumers, firms, governments, and so on. So it is a system of nonlinear equations. It's a theoretical system, and it is also calibrated with uh, real-world data. And it also, it, it mostly contains a lot of economic data. Like you see here, it has information on input output tables, trade protection, macroeconomic data, energy, agriculture, and so on. All these are based on official data sources. Uh, but at the same time, we also include the um, details on emissions, the physical data as well. So this is how the model typically works uh, at a very high level. So you have, um, I'll use the pointer. So you have the consumers consuming products bought from the product markets and the product markets uh, procure these products either from domestic uh, market within the country or from imports from the rest of the world. Similarly, the government uh, procures products domestically or from the rest of the world, imports. Uh, then the producers who sell these products uh, either to consumers or to the government or uh, among themselves. For example, a coal producer 
um, will um, sell coal to uh, steel producer. So there is there are transactions between the various producers, and the producers uh, get help from the factor markets or the land labor capital. These are the factors that contribute to production, and then the money that is earned by them are going to people. So people uh, work as laborers, they get paid. Uh, some people invest money as capital, they get returns on capital. So all these are ultimately the people at large who are consumers. Then the people also save their money uh, and that those savings from various countries are aggregated to a global bank and then invested back into the countries based on the return on investment. So this is a broad uh, uh, structure of these kind of economic models. So within these economic models, there are many different varieties. So we combine two different varieties of these models. One is uh, power, GTAP e-power, or Global Trade Analysis Project, Energy and Environment Power Model. In this model, we have details in terms of uh, renewable energy sectors, uh, then coal, oil, gas, and so on. So this model is good for modeling, looking at emissions and the potential for renewable technologies and so on. And there is another uh, module called GTAP value added model or value addition model, VA model. This would capture the impact of various changes, including the changes in emissions on the, uh, uh, on the different components of Wall Street which is uh, global value chains and so on. So this is a little bit of a detail on how the data is uh, calibrated. So we take the data, we aggregate the data. Uh, the data has all countries in the world, all regions in the world uh, to 141, and they're aggregated into 41 countries and regions. And there are, actually there are 76 sectors, they're aggregated into 39 sectors. And then uh, the data is also updated to the latest available at that point of time. Uh, and then uh, we also take into account the renewable energy capacity using the IRINA data set, um, International Renewable Energy Agency. And then we also take into account the fact that renewable energy, uh, uh, their uh, uh, costs also keep falling. Like for example, solar energy costs uh, generation costs are much lower today compared to some five, six years ago. Then we look at two different scenarios. One scenario in which um, each country would be able to, uh, like between we look at how much the countries reduce emissions between 2010 and 2020. Uh, and we assume that the same kind of emissions reduction will happen from 2020 to 30. So this is one business as usual scenario. So none of the targets may be met here. But there is another scenario called uh, nationally deferred uh, determined contributions, uh, nationally determined contributions, the NDCs of each country. It, uh, we assume that that is achieved. So we look at um, all the countries uh, reaching their targets in terms of emissions reduction. So these are two different scenarios we look at. And this is a little bit of a flowchart of whatever I told you so far, just explaining that. Uh, but before getting into more details, I want to discuss a little bit about what is there in the literature. So the literature suggests that electricity accounts for 40% of total energy consumed, and it also leads to 30% of global uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So given that electricity sector is an important part of fossil fuel combustion, electricity has become a target for various uh, policies which relate to um, improving the environment, um, uh, uh, greening energy, and uh, reducing or mitigating carbon emissions. In this context, um, the ASEAN region, if you take the Southeast Asian region as a whole, uh, they have an emissions gap of around uh, 400, 400 metric uh, tons of uh, CO2, uh, which is basically what, what it means is that they have to reduce 11% of their emissions by 2030 compared to the business as usual or baseline. And this is based on unconditional pledges. So in conditional pledges, which means that there is more global efforts and then there are technological transfers, financial transfers from other countries to the ASEAN region, 
in that context the emissions gap is about 900 metric tons of co2 which also means that the emissions reduction needed by 2030 to meet the targets conditional targets would be around 24 percent so we look at all these different types of targets uh, but actually, if you see the track record between 2010 and 20, the ASEAN member countries have actually increased their emissions. Singapore is the only country which has reduced the emissions by 19%. All other countries have increased their emissions by almost 34%. So um, the, the emissions uh, from the ASEAN countries are about uh, 1,651 1, or 52 metric tons of CO2 by in the, in the year 2020. So now this gives you an impression that the emissions have not been reduced at all. The countries are probably not uh, taking much effort to reduce emissions. But the truth is different. The truth is that they have been taking a lot of effort. So the renewable power capacity of ASEAN uh, has almost doubled from 2014. So 89% increase from uh, 2014, which is right now around 79 gigawatts. Uh, and, and also ASEAN solar capacity has increased 10 times. So 1,321% to 23 gigawatts. So they are making a lot of progress, even in terms of hydroelectric capacity. Uh, they're increasing by 34% to 53 gigawatts. So definitely the, the, the countries are taking a lot of efforts, but still their demand is so high uh, and the demand is so high that this uh, increase in renewable capacity is not enough to offset the, the the emissions. So the emissions are still increasing. So now, in whenever uh, emissions increase, we will assume that in the baseline, we'll assume that the emissions will not increase further between 2020 and 30. Uh, and, 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 and for the second scenario where we have emissions reduction, uh, there we'll assume that the, the, the emission reduction targets are achieved. So in the first scenario, as I mentioned earlier, we only assume that the emissions will not change from 2020 to 30 because all countries have uh, uh, seen an increase in emissions from 2010 to 20. So from 2020 to 30, we assume no uh, change in emissions. So because of that, there is some macro impact, uh, small increase in GDP, small reduction in trade, and small reduction in output. Whereas in scenario two, it's more negative. So the huge decrease in uh, trade, a substantial decrease in, uh, in, in GDP, and, and, and small decrease in output. So this is a broad uh, result. And if you see what is happening in terms of uh, different sectors in the second scenario, you see that the renewables increase a lot. You see the renewables are all in green, whereas other sectors, there are a lot of mixed results. For example, non-renewables typically fall a lot. Renewables increase a lot. So that's one thing we can say. When it comes to other sectors, uh, for example, services, they are less affected. They're not affected that uh, comprehensively. Uh, transportation in countries like Cambodia, they decrease. In Singapore also, in Myanmar, these kind of countries, they decrease a little bit, whereas in other countries, the uh, transportation services increase. Uh, in terms of manufacturing, there can be uh, mostly, speak, mostly there, there, there can be some uh, reduction in many of these countries and some countries that can be increased. In terms of agriculture, again, uh, there will be reduction in most countries. Extraction also, there will be reduction in most countries. So this is a broad uh, uh, conclusion we got for Southeast Asia. Um, uh, of course, I have a lot of results. I'm not showing all of them, given the paucity of time. But what we can conclude is that the cost of reducing emissions to the level of the NDC targets, the nationally determined uh, contributions target of each ASEAN members, if you aggregate that to total ASEAN, is around $50 billion, which is 1.7% of ASEAN's GDP. So it's, a, it's quite a big uh, loss. Um, but in terms of value chain terms, uh, it is much bigger disruption, around $167 billion. So in terms of GDP, the shock is, the, the, the impact is relatively low. But in terms of um, value, chain, value chains and trade, the impact is large. 
Uh, now, what we can say uh, qualitatively based on these results is that the emission reduction targets are achievable not only through strong investment and capacity building, but also through well thought out deployment strategies and policy measures that would foster the replacement of non -renewables. So, just a uh, few minutes ago, I showed you how the non renewables are falling and renewables are increasing uh, when we target uh, the kind of NDC targets. Um, so what you're saying is that these targets cannot be, cannot happen only because of the government setting these targets, but you have to come up with strong investment um, uh, funding and capacity development so that people, the industries can get ready. But also we have to come up with very detailed strategies and policy measures to ensure that the non-renewable energy sources are replaced. And the third point is that the, um, uh, decomposing the various uh, uh, generation sources and increasing the investment in migrating to high efficiency, low emission, renewable power generation technologies. This is the way to go. Um, so we want to, even if you have, even if you continue to uh, stick with uh, fossil fuel energy, then we have to increase the efficiency and reduce the emissions. So this facilitation, this this can be facilitated by moving from, for example, coal to oil, then oil to gas, gas to electricity in general, then within electricity from uh, fossil fuels to renewables. So this kind of step-by-step -step approach should be there. You have to increase efficiency, uh, move from the dirtier uh, fossil fuels to cleaner fossil fuels to then finally to renewables. Um, uh, particularly investment in these uh, 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 no, renewable sources like solar, wind, hydro, that is key to meeting the increasing energy demand, uh, particularly given that the population is growing rapidly and, uh, and the economies are also growing very rapidly. So uh, we cannot afford to stop the growth. The growth has to accelerate. Many countries are very poor, they have to grow very fast, but at the same time, we have to reduce the emissions based on the targets. So now, uh, this is what I, I found for the Southeast Asian countries. Uh, I've done uh, some similar kind of analysis also for Middle Eastern and North African countries. So here, uh, broadly, what we found is that if the status quo is uh, assumed, this uh, uh, scenario one that we discussed before, um, we would uh, we would see that the, the emission reduction will not have much of an impact on GDP, uh, particularly in Egypt and Tunisia. Whereas in other countries like Morocco, there will be a negative impact on GDP, but the uh, the extent the magnitude of impact will be very very small, although around zero point one percent, and this is mainly because of the restrictions on fossil fuel. Whereas uh, for Egypt and Tunisia, there is no impact. Um, now, secondly, um, if we move away from status quo and do a very intensified decarbonization, like what we did in the context of ASEAN scenario two, so this, if we do this, we may be we may be um, affecting the employment, particularly for the low skilled workers, the employment may fall. And the GDP also may um, grow slower, uh, particularly in, in, in three of the in our countries, Middle Eastern North Africa countries, of which you know Egypt is also one of them. So now, um, if we also do it um, in, a, in a gradual uh, manner, um, like for example, uh, five to twelve percent decrease in fossil fuel imports. With, which is achieved by 20% tax on domestic fossil fuel production, 20% subsidy on production of renewables, and so on. So this is kind of a gradual approach. Um, even in this approach, uh, in Morocco, GDP would decline still by 0.2%, and uh, which actually means about uh, around half a billion dollars uh, worth, worth of efficiency losses. Um, if we use the, the quick decarbonization that is cold turkey approach um, then um, you um, you know the way to approach that is to keep 75 to 80 percent uh, 
quota restriction on all fossil fuel imports. So you introduce quota for fossil fuel uh, imports and keep them to 75 to 80%. Uh, and, and that is also achieved by 20% tax on fossil fuel production, 20% subsidy on renewable production. So all these are done. And when we, um, these kind of losses are, are mainly coming from efficiency losses. Again, close to, um, you know, little less than half a billion in Europe, a less, little less than half a billion in Tunisia, but then $3 billion in, in uh, Morocco. So the Morocco Morocco has, uh, is, is kind of more, um, you know, affected because of this. So when we uh, combine the gradual, when you compare these different scenarios, uh, we see that the, um, the subdued um, GDP effects happen um, in 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 uh, both scenarios, and that is because of the the resiliency of household consumption and increased government expenditure. And that is on one side, on the other side, declining investment and increasing trade deficits. So positive uh, move comes from the household and government. Negative move comes from investment and uh, trade. Um, in terms of prices and inflation, decarbonization leads to food price hikes. That can be, yeah, we, we, we could observe some positive increases in food prices and, 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 and in the, but even in the gradual approach, the food prices may increase, um, but, but it may not increase so much. But so far, you may get an impression that the decarbonization is always uh, a bad, bad thing because of all this economic impact. But it is not necessarily true. Uh, as you can see here, the the, the quota, uh, even when you have quota on fossil fuel import and production, um, the, the terms of trade effects are positive. Uh, and uh, they also offset the, the negative welfare effects caused by uh, various losses, allocative efficiency losses, endowment losses, and so on. So, but there is also one more uh, positivity, and that is technical progress. So when when we have technological progress, even when uh, in, even when we assume very very fast decarbonization, um, we would uh, actually uh, increase the GDP instead of decreasing it. Uh, one percent increase in GDP for Morocco, two percent increase in GDP for Egypt and Tunisia. All these things will happen with such an increase in uh, technological progress. Um, so there will be, uh, uh, you know, job losses uh, in, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in most of the scenarios. Uh, but uh, when you have technological progress, this is the scenario that I mentioned, uh, then there are no job losses. There are actually positive effects in unemployment. And, and uh, uh, basically, if we have more and more productivity effects, uh, these gains can increase further. And such an increase in productivity can lead to um, lead to uh, sustainable increases in these investments because many countries are worried about where does the investment come from? Where, where do we get the money to invest in the green energy? So if the green energy um, investments automatically trigger this kind of productivity increases, uh, that can help mitigate any loss and hence, you'll keep uh, getting getting uh, positive gains from the decarbonization. So similarly, we also have to look at uh, diversifying the sources of electricity um, and, 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 and ensure that they are more and more renewable. Uh, for some countries, an approach could be that you don't have to shut down the coal-based thermal power plants and so on. You can keep them, but then all the new uh, capacities can come from uh, can come from the uh, renewables. So basically, um, uh, we uh, we can say that there is no one coherent story. Um, different countries have different kind of responses to decarbonization from an economic side. Uh, so we uh, are able to uh, take into account a lot of uh, this this uh, frictions involved in decarbonization. Uh, but we we do not uh, sufficiently capture the the positive externalities from decarbonization 
Uh, the only way we are doing that is to increase the productivity. But in reality, that can be a big game changer. So with this, I'll uh, conclude my uh, uh, presentation and the discussion and and uh, just broadly tell you um, uh, in, in conclusion that decarbonization is a very important uh, uh, policy change that is happening globally and, and uh, different countries are responding to it in different ways. Uh, but definitely the governments have to come up with uh, very... Um, clear uh, policies to encourage renewables and discourage uh, fossil fuels. Um, at the same time, take into account the public welfare, ensure that the prices do not increase much and uh, and there are jo enough jobs for people and so on. So we want to balance the decarbonization objectives with economic development. So that is the fundamental uh, premise of all these studies. So thank you very much once again. I look forward to any any questions. Thank you, Professor Badri. It is very insightful. And I would like to express my gratitude for giving us your time and sharing your work. And give, you would never say no whenever we ask you. We come to us again before. And then you are sharing your contributions. We have a lot of people in the, the, the room and we have a lot of questions. Uh, I will keep my question at the end. And I have, I think, Professor Madok Donham from Macedonia. She is having a question and she is going to ask you a simple question. Morning. Uh, hi. Uh, congratulations uh, on the um, uh, really important topic presented uh, to us. Uh, decarbonization, uh, it's not just uh, the um, re relevant for uh, the Asian countries, but it's also relevant for the European continent and worldwide. Uh, I was just when I was um, listening and looking at the um, uh, the model you have used. I have one question crossing my mind: the renewable, actually decarbonization of um, uh, electricity generation and uh, switching towards renewables. Uh, as renewables are not that much uh, labor intensive uh, operations and. Um, uh electricity generation from fossil fuels employs a lot of uh, workforce uh is this um uh, fact taken into account in the um, uh, model and personally what do you think are we ready to offer something else um uh, uh, maybe a um uh, i don't know uh, switch towards uh, give these people opportunities because they will be left uh, without jobs uh, worldwide. Thank you. Question, uh, Professor. I agree with you. Uh, as you, uh, the two things here. One is that uh, uh, from the some of the numbers that I showed, uh, you could you could also see that the you know there could be negative effects of negative economic effects coming from decarbonization. Uh, even uh, even uh, without going into the other details, um, so because because you are actually forcing the economies to uh, move in a different path uh, compared to the the usual path that they have taken, they would have taken right. Uh, many countries uh, are, are are very poor now and uh, developing countries, and they they have to grow, and and when they grow, when 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 like the developed countries were growing some hundred years ago, when they when they were growing. There were not many constraints. They were able to grow whatever resources they wanted to take, they could take and grow. But now for the poor and developing countries, if uh, in today's situation, they have to take into account the decarbonization strategy. So that will actually decelerate growth in some, some cases. So that is one thing. But also your point about uh, 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 jobs is, is very important. Uh, the model does take into account uh, the the different uh, labor intensities of different sectors, right? So the labor intensity of uh, the fossil fuel based sectors uh, uh, is is quite high, so they keep employing a lot of people. Whereas the labor intensity of many of the renewable energy sectors are is is actually low, uh, but there is also a time dimension here. So the 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 transition itself is very labor intensive when the transition process happens in the in the short to medium term uh, horizon uh, there there is going to be a lot of jobs because 
uh, because we, things are in a flux, we are moving from one technology to another. You need people skilled in those technologies to establish those technologies, establish those industries, establish those uh, power plants and so on, right? So, but then if you take after like five years or so, uh, then um, in terms of uh, maintenance and operations of the, of these power plants, uh, they are going to be less uh, labor intensive compared to uh, the, the thermal power plants. So that is when you'll start feeling the heat of uh, lack of uh, employment over time. Uh, but but uh, as I mentioned earlier, even with the immediate, uh, you know, in, in, in the short to medium term also, uh, without other policy interventions, there can be negative economic impact, which also can lead to um, negative impact on jobs. So that is why uh, one of the conclusions I said was to be very pragmatic in this decarbonization. We cannot directly say that, okay, let's close all the coal-fired thermal power plants and replace them with solar power plants, for example. So that is not going to work. We have to be very pragmatic. Maybe first, first uh, approach should be to increase efficiency, even in fossil fuel-based uh, sectors. Uh, secondly, move from... Uh, the dirtier fossil fuels to the cleaner fossil fuels like coal to oil, oil to gas, and so on, and then ultimately come to uh, renewables. And also for developed countries, uh, one more uh, thing is, as I also mentioned, uh, there is so much uh, deficit of electricity and power there. So if the renewable, if the developing countries can ensure that the new uh, power generation capacity that is needed. Uh, is all done using renewables, but the existing power uh, generation can still uh, stay with uh, fossil fuels. So we don't have to shut down all those uh, power plants. So that will also ensure that uh, the transition is smooth and uh, we have uh, more jobs generated because we are talking about, we are not talking about uh, reducing a sector and expanding another sector, but you are saying that, okay, this sector, let it remain the same but then let us then let us develop a new sector which is green on top of the existing uh, brown sector so if you do that then uh, there will be uh, limited uh, losses in terms of job and uh, even in terms of economics uh, but of course one more thing is we don't which we don't take into account here uh, is uh, the health of people the, the the issues coming from climate change you know drought uh, floods and all these things. So those things are not factored in, in this analysis. So if we take into account those aspects, the uh, negative effect of uh, carbon emissions, uh, the economic negative economic effect of carbon emissions, then all the losses that we see here uh, will uh, will be very small compared to the kind of uh, gains that you have because of these emissions reduced. And that also will have uh, some impact on jobs because if people are healthier, uh, people can survive. Um, I know that that also is going to contribute positively to the labor market. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much for your question. You want to, don't want no, to ask? I'm okay. Not ask. I just want to say very, very great presentation. You you answered all my questions actually. Yes, she was preparing thank my you. questions and you answered in your pre presentation. Thank you so much, and thank you for thank your you. Time. thank you. Thank you so much, Professor, and wishing to see thank you, you more again in Cairo. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Then let's go to the second uh, our speakers, one of the top uh, uh, top notch uh, professors, uh, Professor Khalid Al Husseini, was uh, appointed as a professor in accounting at Banjul University uh, Business School in 2024. Formerly held a different position at Blemis, Sterling, Manchester, uh, Ain Shams University, which is the same university I'm graduated from. Or I'm so happy to have you here. And you have more than 25 years of teaching experience across undergraduate and postgraduate levels. And he has growing research reputation. And I'm so happy to say that he is one of the top world ranking in research, 2% researchers database created by experts of Stanford. Uh, I'm feel jealous uh, in accounting. I was major accounting before, but some congratulations, Professor. And the floor is yours. You are going to talk about sustainability in accounting research. Good morning, Professor. Okay, good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for uh, inviting me to speak about uh, my research interest, which is sustainability accounting. It is my honor to be with you today. 
and special thanks to Dr. Dua Salman and all colleagues who uh, helped in our organizing this conference. And I hope that this conference will be a successful one. Uh, so today I will not present one of my papers, just I will uh, present like a survey of the literature about sustainability in accounting uh, research, because it's one of the main research interests I'm working on over the last 20 years. So specifically, uh, the presentation will cover uh, five main questions we always ask in the accounting literature. The first question is, why do companies disclose non-financial information at all? We know that uh, companies produce financial statements like balance sheet, cash flow statement, income statement. But the question is why they should disclose this kind of information, which is non-financial information like sustainability. Uh, then I will define what I mean by sustainability in the context of accounting, because sustainability definition is different based on the context. The third question will be how researchers measure sustainability in organization. So how can we measure the level of sustainability, especially from the accounting point of view when we talk about sustainability accounting? The fourth question, what drives companies to disclose information about sustainability and also to increase the level of sustainability reporting, especially this kind of information is not required by law, it's not mandatory. And the last question is what benefits do firms gain from providing such information? So I will try to find out what are the main drivers for firms to disclose this information, and if they disclose this information, what kind of benefits they might get. So these are the five questions I will try to answer briefly in 15 minutes. First of all, why do firms disclose non-financial information? Why not firms just disclose the financial statements? There is evidence in the literature that financial statements lost their relevance. Lost their relevance means that stakeholders need to have a more useful information for the decision-making process. And the traditional accounting financial statements model are no longer satisfy the user's need. Therefore, there is a lot of calls for a more comprehensive business reporting model rather than the simple one which consider only uh, financial statements. So for the comprehensive model for business reporting, the goal was highlighted that firms should disclose beside financial statements, they should in include also non-financial information like forward-looking information, uh, strategy, risk, non-financial uh, performance measures, any narrative reporting which could complement the financial statement information. So this was like the main reasons why firms now are encouraged to disclose information uh, in their uh, annual report, just to complement the information included in the financial statement. Because we know that in the financial statement, they present information about what has been done over the last 12 months. So it is past information, it is historical information. But the stakeholders for the decision making process, they need current information as well as future information. So this raises the role of non-financial information or the narrative information, including sustainability. So for sustainability specifically, we have different frameworks which cover all types of non-financial reporting, but also we have a specific framework which highlight the importance of disclosing information about sustainability in corporate annual report. So most of this report try to provide a guidance for the firm to the best way to communicate non-financial information to their stakeholders in a clear way. Because the most important thing here for the information, the information should be easy to understand and also uh, easy to read by the stakeholders. Because if the information is easy to read, it will be easy also to understand. And if the stakeholders understand the information well, they can make the right decision. So for sustainability, we have different uh, frameworks and the most uh, famous one and the most common one in the accounting literature is GRI. GRI is like independent international standard organization which help business 
governments and organization to understand and communicate information related to sustainability, like climate change, human rights, corruption, and so on. So researchers try to look at this kind of framework to think about measurement or measuring uh, sustainability information, and then try to find out what are the main reasons for disclosing this information in the annual report, and what are the impact of disclosing this information. So in accounting context, when we talk about sustainability, we are talking about three different dimensions. We are talking about environmental impact, we talk about social responsibility and also governance practice. So we mean by sustainability here, the practice of incorporating the three elements, environmental, social, and governance uh, considerations into financial accounting. With environmental, we talk about uh, the measurement and reporting of the organization use of environmental related issues. So we can see that the firm can talk about natural resources or emissions or waste management or energy consumption or in or any efforts related to the environmental impact. For the social responsibility, we can see that firms uh, disclose information about their activities related to employee welfare, community engagement, diversity, inclusion, human rights, and so on. For the governance practice here, firms focus on transparency, ethics, and corporate governance, and the extent to which they are compliant with law and regulations, because we need to be sure that organizations operate in a responsible and accountable uh, manner. When we look at sustainability from the context of accounting, we refer to other related concepts like treble bottom line reporting. Uh, treble bottom line reporting is a concept of sustainability, which is related to profit and social, which is people and environmental performance as a measure of success of the business. So the old model just focus on the profitability, but now we are looking at profit and social and environmental performance of the firm. Within this context as well, we have what we call integrated reporting, when we integrate financial and non-financial information in one report to provide a holistic view, view about the company uh, performance. The main purpose is to uh, achieve the long-term value creation. So firm is now shifting from their focus on short-term profit maximization to the long-term value creation. And we think that if the firm is keen to achieve the ESG performance or the sustainability indicators, this will help them to align their activity with SDG or sustainable development goals. So what happens in the literature? in this area. In accounting literature, we have three different areas. The first one, how can we measure sustainability in organization? When we talk about sustainability in accounting, we are talking about sustainability, either performance or uh, sustainability disclosure. Most of the research look at sustainability disclosure, measuring uh, environmental, social, and the government's disclosure in organization. So the method we use normally to measure disclosure about sustainability in the annual report is to use uh, content analysis. So researchers create disclosure index. Uh, companies, uh, researcher create disclosure index which contains all items that the firm encourage to disclose. So they use manual content analysis other researchers use computer-based content analysis by using some keywords to measure disclosure, and there is a long debate in the literature about whether researchers are using the quantity of the information or the quality of the information. And this debate still exists till today because we believe that stakeholders will not be interested in the quantity of the information, they will be more interested in the quality of the information. 
Also, there is many databases which provide information about sustainability. We have Bloomberg, which give us sustainability score. We also have another database, which called Blusura, which provides sustainability score for companies uh, in many countries. Also, other researchers try to focus on a specific dimension of sustainability. So we, when we look at the research, we can see that some researchers focus on environmental dimension of sustainability, other look at the social dimension, or the third one might focus on the governance. So looking at environmental, for example, we can see research papers focusing on greenhouse gas emissions or energy used and energy consumption. There is also many papers look at water uh, waste management or water consumption. Uh, this kind of research is looking at individual dimension of sustainability rather than the holistic approach. So we have the two different side of stories. Also for the social uh, in dimension, we can see many research in this area about human rights and labor and other research about uh, community engagement or product responsibility. And for the corporate governance, we have also a huge uh, literature about the compliance with governance code. And also we have extensive research about uh, ethics and anti-corruption. So researcher here either use a holistic approach to measure sustainability, looking at E, S, and G together, or as a researcher might use or focus on individual score, environmental or score or uh, social or governance score. So when this, uh, the researchers measure the level of uh, sustainability reporting, they ask the next question, what drives firm to disclose this information? Why firms increasing their level of disclosure in terms of sustainability? So looking at the literature, I can see that there are three different groups which uh, drive firms to disclose this information. The first one is a firm specific variables like firm size, firm age, liquidity, profitability, leverage, industry type, dividend payment, and uh, firm gross rate. So if we look at firm size, for example, the literature shows that if the firm is large enough in terms of their total assets or market market capitalization, they will disclose more information about sustainability compared with small firms. Firm age, again, if the firm is old enough, it will disclose more information compared with young uh, uh, firms and so on. The second group of the literature look at the impact of corporate governance mechanism on sustainability reporting and Evidence shows that board characteristics like board size, board independence, and audit committee characteristics like number of audit committee meetings, audit uh, committee expertise uh, affect sustainability reporting. And also there is evidence that the ownership structure of the firm affect sustainability reporting. Some study look at the cross country uh, study by looking at different countries and they try to find out whether there is country specific variables affect the level of sustainability reporting. And uh, the answer was yes, there are some variables affect sustainability reporting. And these variables different from country to country like GDP, corruption uh, scores or corruption levels and cultural dimensions. So they provide measure for sustainability and then they try to find out why firms disclose this information. And the third question was, what happened if the firm disclose sustainability information in their report? What kind of benefits do firm gain from providing this information, especially from uh, stakeholders? So most of the research here focus on different theories like stakeholder theory or signaling theory or agency theory. So they started the debate by the demand on such information arises from the information asymmetry between managers and stakeholders. We know that managers know more information compared with the stakeholders. 
So there is a kind of information asymmetry between the two parties, insiders and outsiders. So they believe that if we increase the level of disclosure in general and sustainability in particular, this will reduce the information asymmetry. So in this study, they try to find out what happens if firms disclose information in the annual report about sustainability. What are the potential impacts of such action or such practice? They found that when a firm discloses more information about sustainability in their annual report, the level of information asymmetry between managers and stakeholders is reduced. And when once this level of information asymmetry is reduced, they have some desirable consequences. What they found, they found that increasing the level of sustainability reporting lead to improvement in the firm performance. So there is a positive relationship between sustainability reporting and financial performance. Also, they found that there is a positive relationship between sustainability reporting and environmental performance. So this concludes that firms are encouraged to disclose information about sustainability or about ESG to give signal to stakeholders about this kind of strategic information. And by doing so, firm will be sustainable in the future as well. So these are the, what has been done in the literature. Uh, for me, I think that this research is a hot research area. We can see that many researchers are doing research in this area. And even there are some journals are specialized in sustainability and sustainability-related areas. So to move forward, I suggest four ideas for uh, this area of research. First of all, if we look at the measurement of sustainability disclosure in the literature, we will find that most of the researchers try to count the number of words or sentences or paragraphs related to sustainability. I believe that this is not enough because quantity is not important for the uh, stakeholders. The stakeholders will be keen to read the information and you also will be keen about the quality of the information itself. So I think that one area of uh, research for the future is to use the artificial intelligence to measure the quality of sustainability report. And most of the researchers focus on sustainability report in the annual report. So this is not sufficient because nowadays firms disclose information in social media. So we can look at sustainability information in Twitter or Facebook or any social media related uh, platforms. So looking at the quality of the information will be very important and more important than looking at the quantity of the information. So we can look at uh, measures for readability. So can test to see the extent to which the information is easy to read, because if the information is easy to read, it will be easy to understand so stakeholders can make the right decision. Also, we can look at the tone of the information. If the information includes good news or bad news. So we need to find out a measure for the quality of the information rather than just focusing on the quantity of the information. The second uh, area of uh, research I am suggesting is to look at uh, different attributes of directors. So when we look at the literature, we can see that uh, most of the literature look at corporate governance. And you look at the number of people on the board or number of women on the board when they look at the board, the, uh, the gender diversity. I think gender diversity is important, but women number is not sufficient. We need to look at the attributes of gender rather than the number of women on the board. I mean here by the att attributes, their education, their expertise, their experience. So this, the, their leadership, I think the attributes might be a good drive driver for sustainability disclosure compared with just their number on the board. Also, I found that most of the research about sustainability focus on the impact of sustainability reporting on financial performance or environmental performance. This is fine, but this will 
was well uh, examined in the literature, I think researchers need to move forward to look at the impact of sustainability disclosure on other uh, finance or accounting related topics, like the impact of sustainability disclosure on investment efficiency, uh, cash holding, cost of capital, dividend policy, try to find out other potential impact of sustainability on different dimension or financial consequence. The last point here is very important because there is very limited research in this area and in disclosure area in general. Most of the research about uh, impact of disclosure look at the financial or the economic consequences only. So there is very limited research about the non-economic consequences. So I believe that researchers also need to find out what are the main non-economic consequences of uh, sustainability information. For example, how such information could affect customer satisfaction. So I think this is a very hot area of research researchers need to look at. And I think I should end now by saying thank you very much for inviting me and I wish you all the best in your conference. Thank you so much, Dr. Khalid, for uh, for your interesting presentation concerning sustainability in accounting. And I have uh, Professor Ellen, we have a question for you. Yes. Hello, uh, thank you for your presentation. And not to comment on the gender uh, uh, suggestion that you gave. Uh, my, com my question is about um, uh, generally, I would suggest first maybe a little bit more research uh, with um, more data from companies and so on as to how they feel when they need to, let's say, research uh, and would they need to report on uh, these uh, topics. But uh, my, my question is about uh, auditors. Do you think they're ready to check the reports such as they are? because uh, they know the financial data and everything, but we are now including, especially in Europe, more and more information, as you mentioned, about sustainability. And if not verified, this information would be irrelevant. They may lie in the reports. So do you think the auditors uh, are ready to go through this type of reports? Thank you. Uh, yes, I think editors should provide assurance about the information disclosed in the annual report in general. All narrative disclosure, not sustainability only, but all narrative section of the annual report should uh, be checked by the editors because this information is very strategic information which affect stakeholders' decisions. So if uh, editors, auditors provide assurance on this information, I think this will increase the credibility of the information included in the, in the annual report and hence will increase the rational decision makings. Thank you. Thank you so much for your feedback and your comments, Professor. And thank you again for your time and for finding time to share your experience with us. Thank you, Professor. Let's go thank for you. our third speaker, Professor Andres Artel. He's a close friend of mine. He is a PhD, a full professor of the Department of Economics uh, of Accounting and Finance in Technical University, Cartagena, Spain, a research association in the Institute of International Economy in Valencia, Spain. Good morning. His main research is in tourism, regional international economics publication in the area of tourism, including tourist behavior uh, with application, other topics interesting. Uh, good morning, Professor. Thank you so much for finding times for us. Okay, good morning. Yeah. Uh, I'm sharing the screen. Um, okay. Yeah. First of all, uh, first of all, yeah. Uh, start um, thanking for your uh, opportunity of of inviting me to this uh, very interesting third international conference on resilience, sustainability, in management. Uh, all the MSA board as well. So. <clears throat> Even that there are a lot of, I have been checking the, the program and even there are a lot of um, reflection papers, intervention on management. I decide to, to focus my intervention on the tourist sector, given that it's a sector I have been working for for a number of years. Uh, so the title of my um, <clears throat> presentation will be Resilience and Sustainability, Reflections on the Case of the Tourist Sector, the, main outline will be, uh, I will start focusing on the capacity of the tourist sector in terms of resilience, uh, different impacts in the last year, financial shock or the 
COVID impact and how uh, this um, sector have been recovering from this uh, very huge impact. After that, uh, I will focus on the topic of sustainability. Uh, I will give you some ideas and some some case studies on the on the how to implement sustainability in the in the tourist sector. Uh, how how the World Tourist Organization is is recommending to uh, develop a system of indicators in order to be able to measure and and be aware of what's the level of sustainability of different uh, destinations all around the world. And finally, we'll share some some some. Uh, uh, results on the uh, uh, slight application we have done of this uh, system of indicator for our uh, region, um, region of Murcia, where I, I'm working. Okay, so just to start in terms of how resilient is the, is the world tourist sector, you can see here in this figure, uh, international tourist uh, arrivals and, and receipts. Uh, first, first, um, First, the uh, idea is that uh, tourist sector is a very growing, uh, very important growing sector in the last 20 years, as you have seen. Uh, we have reached uh, in the world more than 1.4 uh, billion of, of arrivals. And uh, in terms of receipts, more or less, more or less the same, uh, 1.5 uh, thousand billion uh, dollars. So it's a very growing, uh, very interesting um, to, to be studying because it, it, it creates a lot of employment and, and wealth for, for countries. We're especially concerned with this uh, sector because we are uh, both uh, Spain and Egypt, Mediterranean countries. So Mediterranean is the first, the top destination in the world. So we must be aware of what's happening in this sector. We, we can see here uh, the impact of different uh, recent crises. For example, the SARS crisis did, didn't impact that much, but yeah, in fact, was a reduction of 2 million of arrivals and um, minus 2% in, in, in receipts. The global economic crisis 2009 was so much huge impact with a reduction of 35 million uh, of arrivals in the world and a reduction of 79 uh, billion uh, dollars minus 4%. And definitely the most relevant uh, impact was uh, seen in the in the recent pandemic, COVID-19, uh, uh, with a reduction in 1.1 billion uh, arrivals and nearly 63% of the, of the total receipt. However, as we can see here in this figure, uh, the recovery has ta taken uh, more or less three, three, four years. But now 2023 or 2024, we, we, we have been reaching the pre-COVID uh, level. So in fact, this, this is a, a very resilient uh, sector, tourist sector, given the huge impact we have seen here in the in the from 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 COVID uh, pandemic. In fact, if, if if we follow the if we follow the news of the WTO World Tourist Organization, uh, we see now that in 2024, international tourists have reached 97 percent of pre-pandemic level. Um, so um, splitting on the different regions in the world. Um, we will see with more detail in the following um, slide. But um, yeah, after after this uh, recovery, um, nearly ninety seven percent of the of the previous uh, levels, um, the World Tourist Organization is recommending to uh, <clears throat> improve the the sustainability and inclusion uh, policies at uh, destination. Um, and taking care of externalities uh, derived from the impact of the tourist sector on local resources and especially on, on local culture and, and communities. So this, this is starting to speak on sustainability issues in the, in the sector. Split by regions, we, we, we can see here that uh, 
the, the, the world has uh, nearly recovering 97% minus 3% as we have uh, said. Uh, Europe um, has even reached uh, plus 2% in the 2024 in comparison with the, with the pre-COVID um, 2019. Uh, Asia um, is still uh, at minus 18% uh, uh, levels of, of arrivals uh, in terms of the pre-COVID uh, situation. America is just reaching minus 1%, Africa uh, surpassed by plus uh, 5%, and the Middle East is the most growing uh, and recovering uh, from the pre-COVID level. It, this is in terms of tourist arrival. Uh, we can see here uh, top tourism destinations. Most of them are from Europe or Mediterranean area, both in terms of arrival, so receipts, uh, in terms of receipts, for example, we, we see here the Arab Emirates. Um, so, so, so more or less, uh, these are the top destination. Uh, we are especially interested in, in, in research in tourism because Spain is at the top, uh, in, the, in the second top destination in the world, both in terms of arrivals and receipts. So, the, the, and, and, and you can see other uh, France, Italy, um, the UK. Germany, Greece, Austria, as a very important um, tourist sector in the in the European area. So this is a important industry in in Europe and in Spain. Main recommendations of the UNWTO World Tourism Organization. Uh, what are the main factors uh, fostering the recovery? That resilience. Uh, well, um, of course, some kind of cost uh, issues, uh, transport and accommodation costs, uh, energy costs, and so on, rising uh, in the in the last month, in the last uh, years. So this is an very very important factor nowadays for the recovery of of this sector. The situation in general of the economic environment uh, at countries at destination. So of course, this this is also an important issue some weather uh, situation. This Israeli conflict is, is very important because we are, uh, as I said, in this in this top tourist destination area. So it, it, it has, uh, of course, an, an impact, uh, social impact, of course, uh, life impact, but uh, in, in terms of tourism uh, flows as well. Some um, uh, qualification and, and uh, availability of, of human resources, staff uh, shortages, the, the the offensive of Russia in Ukraine is, is also important. Some uh, consumer confidence and other other industry issues or or, or political issues like like uh, visa requirements or uh, congestion, flight delays, and and so on. So these are the most important nowadays in the in the 2024 May survey from the UNWTO. These are the most important factors in terms of recovery. Moving to sustainability in tourists, um, yeah, we, we, we have to be aware, we are all aware that uh, tourism is a fast growing industry. All world destinations want to join uh, this kind of uh, wealth uh, generating sector and employment creation. But sometimes uh, it start to be for popular destination, it start to be a uh, a real problem in terms of sustainability mm. because there are crowd uh, of of people uh waste of resources uh a, a social impact on the resident population in some uh periods of of you know, uh, high seasons and so on i i put here some pictures in order to give you <laughs> A graphic uh, example. In fact, uh, we define tourist carrying, uh, carrying capacity as um, defined by the World Tourist Organization as the maximum number of people that may visit a tourist destination at the same time without uh, causing destruction of the physical, economic, sociocultural environment and an acceptable decrease in the quality of visitors and residents. Um, quality of life, uh, satisfaction uh, of, of the visit. We, 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 can, we can put a number of examples. As I said, um, Europe and the Mediterranean basin uh, is 
the top destination in the world. Uh, more, more than 300 uh, million of visitors per year. And especially at high seasons, uh, some of the places uh, you want to visit or some of the um, population at uh, this resident population at destination really suffer the impact of, of tourism. You know? The example of of Acropolis here in, in of Barcelona, um, uh, the case of Venice, you no, know, with a very huge impact, or even uh, in the pyramids, you no, know, in, in Giza, Cairo. Um, so we are all suffering this kind of um, impact. So we really wonder uh, how can we. Um, how can we improve the sustainability of this sector? No? And in order to improve the sustainability of the tourist sector, first of all, of course, uh, we need some methodology, some methodologies uh, to measure what, to define what do we understand uh, that is sustainability in the tourist sector and how to measure that sustainability. Uh, th th this is the this is the concept I I want to develop. Uh, I'm developing here in this presentation how to manage uh, sustainability in tourism and how to proceed. No, in this case uh, again uh, we follow uh, recommendations of the United Nations 2030 agenda um, that has um, in, in 2015 defined a package of 17. SDG Sustainable Development Goals with 169 targets to define a global paradigm for social equity, economic growth, and environmental uh, protection of human development. Uh, rapidly, uh, two years later, the WTO World Tourism Organization identified tourists as a key sector to catalyze these uh, SDGs. In fact, uh, recently in 2023, uh, this uh, WTO launched what they uh, named it the statistical framework for measuring the sustainability in tourism. So really um, identifying and defining a methodology in order to measure uh, sustainability with, with a system of, of indicators and so on. In fact, this is the most updated guide defining a sustainable tourist model through indicators and different areas uh, enable to coordinate efforts and sharing a common la language between all stakeholders in the in the in the tourist industry. As an answer, this initiative result in a set of uh, developments or or uh, applications uh, of this proposal at the international, European, and national level. Uh, in the case of Spain, I will show you. Uh, yeah. I'm aiming to define system of tourist sustainability indicators to operationalize and implement uh, this concept, co complex concept of tourist sustainability. In what follows, I, I, I will I will um, present in more detail two of this proposal: the one of the European tourist indicators sector and that of the smart tourism model uh, in, in Spain. In fact, these are the, the two. Uh, proposals. This is the one of the European Commission. It's called the European Tourism Indicator System. And this is the one from the Ministry of Tourism in Spain. Is what they call the Smart Tourist uh, Destination. Uh, <clears throat> in more detail, um, if we move to the ETIS uh, European uh, Commission um, proposal, we see here four main areas. One broad uh, area for, for destination management, um, dealing with um, applying some policies for sustainable tourism or taking care of um, tourist uh, customers' satisfaction. And then um, <clears throat> focusing on the dimensions of economic sustainability, of uh, social and cultural uh, sustainability and environmental uh, sustainability. In the case of economic value, they focus on measuring volume and, and value of tourists uh, arriving to the destination, how the business uh, are performing in the companies in the in the tourist sector, the quantity and quality of employment uh, generated, 
And how about the supply chain for this for this uh, sector? In terms of social and cultural impact, they are following different um, uh, instrument or indicators. The impact on the community, health and safety, gender equality, inclusion and accessibility, and the protection of cultural heritage, identity, and, and cultural um, assets. In terms of environmental impact, uh, they are focusing on re reducing the impact of transportation. This is CO CO CO2 impact emissions from uh, flights and so on. Climate change, um, waste, uh, solid waste, uh, western water uh, treatment, water water management, energy consumption, or the protection of the biodiversity. Of course, these are um, big areas, and after that, each of them they they, they um, split in in a number of of more numerous uh, indicators to be applied. In the case of the smart tourist model in Spain, uh, they focus on they focus on five main areas: governance, innovation, technology, and accessibility. And one more is that of uh, sustainability, focusing on on focusing on sustainability. Yeah, um, we have sociocultural, environmental. Um, economic and safe uh, destination. Yeah, moving to, sorry. Moving to our application, we, we, we take uh, 38 indicators and apply a principal components and factor analysis in order to identify what are the main areas because we have, one, one of the problems is how to operationalize this, um, this big number of indicators. Um, uh, Making application to the 45 destination in the region of Murcia in Spain, we find that we found that for this specific case, the most important is uh, regulation for sustainability in terms of social and environmental dimension, sustainable management of local resources and goods, defining and implementing system of indicators, a local urban sustainable system. Protecting heritage and landscape, uh, intangible culture and identity, and finally taking care of seasonality, um, fostering a friendly interaction between tourists and residents. Th th these are the uh, basic um, core areas for our case study. Uh, well, um, thanks for your attention, and I will be happy to answer any question or suggestion. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Professor. Any more questions? You have questions from us from the stair here? Okay. I have one question I saw before uh, in a documentary that uh, in one of the European countries, they start to impose taxation and they are trying to put more fees for the people in order, especially in Venetia, they try to use the macro policies in order to hinder people to come because they are over exploiting the resources there. Do you think that this is policies will be work? And I think it is matching as one with the results are according to the confirmatory factor analysis. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Yeah, I I, I think it's, they, they are important. Not, not only, for example, Venice is the extreme case. Uh, they not only impose uh, fees, but the, they, they impose a quota of, of uh, daily visitors. Because you, you you have to think that uh, Venice is a very very specific uh, case of destination surrounded by by water. So, in fact, the 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 very huge uh, not only social because not many uh, people uh, from Venice uh, are still living there. They, they, in fact, they they have been uh, spelled out to the surroundings. But uh, there are other fees, for example, in Spain, many destinations started, there is a discussion on, on uh, starting to impose some uh, hotel uh, fee uh, for visitors. I think we, we, I think it will be important to manage a uh, number of people arriving to destinations. For example, Spain this year has 85 million international visitors plus 70 million of domestic visitors. So this is a country of 50 million people with 150 million uh, tourists. So of course, that's why we are all engaged in this uh, area of tourism research because we are living in the Mediterranean, as I said, the top destination in the world. 
So yes, uh, at least in, in high season, we, we, we have to start to impose some measures in order to manage the number of people arriving, kind of people arriving. And yeah, of course, through taxis or other policy uh, interventions. Thank you, Professor. They have another, Helen have a question. Yes, you, yeah. you have a question from the floor. Why tourist behavior not included in the measures? Behavior. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. As I, as I said, uh, not the number of people, but the kind of people and how they behave. For example, in Barcelona, this was this has been a very important problem because in the in the down in the downtown, uh, many people uh, quit to to live in that place because it, it has converted in a thematic part for European uh, young people visiting uh, the city and nobody nobody um, uh, sleeping there or, or having a, a normal life so yeah uh, in fact the police there started to implement some some actions in order to improve behavior in this uh, very touristic uh, Airbnb uh, neighborhoods thank you professor uh, I'm so happy that you find time and I'm so happy that you accept my invitation. And usually I'm happy to work with you. We have a lot of publications and it was very sounding. And I wish I can see you soon, inshallah, in Egypt. You are most welcome here. And thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. And the peoples are sending their uh, hi for you. You know many of them here. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you for the invitation. It has been a pleasure. To be thank here. you so much. Thank nice you. to see you. Let's go for our, uh, we have two more guest speakers. Uh, in this session, I will try to manage the time. I put the questions across the each one speakers not to hinder them and not to take from their time. So we have two speakers, uh, Dr. Prashant Parak, Santi Baz Business School from India. And we will have uh, the Professor Dr. Ahmad Al Amir. And we are going to split the 30 minutes 15 for Prashant and 15 minutes for Dr. Ahmed. Thank you so much. Good morning. Dr. Pashant is an associate professor in Santi Business School in India. He is a TEDx speaker and author. His total academic experience is more than a decade. Uh, regularly writes articles for leading media avenues of over India. His area of teaching and researching is in marketing and entrepreneurship. Good morning, doctor. Good morning, and hope I am audible and my screen is visible to all of you. Can you raise I your voice a little bit? Yeah, just give me a second. Yeah, good morning. So hope now my voice is also uh, reaching to you guys. Hello? Yes, it, yes, it's better now. Yeah, that's fantastic. So first and foremost, thank you to the management of MSC University for providing me with this opportunity to be a part of this esteemed conference. And uh, this is really an uh, amalgamation of amazing uh, scholars and speakers. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about a case on which I'm working since last few months, uh, Sustainable Business Practices, Perspectives from Gujarat's dairy sector. So Sustainable Business Practices in the dairy sector of India, and uh, this case is supported by uh, Government of India, and uh, since last three, four months, I am uh, working on this. Now, it, this, it is about, it is about in enhancing the productivity of uh, the milk. Uh, uh, the cattle, uh, so that the rural folks can earn better by selling their milks to the dairy of the state. So we all know that Anand Milk Union Limited brand Amul is known worldwide and how they manage their supply chain, they how they manage their value chain. Uh, this case focuses on that and how they are trying their best to enhance the livelihood of rural folks. Uh, we, have, we have tried to cover these aspects in this. Now, the picture which you see on the screen is a chaff cutter machine. Now, there are two types of chaff cutter machines. One is hand operated and the other one is motor operated. And uh, there, is a, there is a small scale industry in uh, uh, somewhere around 70 kilometers away from the national capital of India, New Delhi. Uh, they, are, they have 32, 34 small scale units, uh, which are in the business of manufacturing chaff cutter machines. Now, Government of India is helping this industrial cluster to enter in various states of India. Uh, so they entered in Uttar Pradesh, they entered in uh, 
uh, Haryana, etc. Uh, in uh, 2023, December, government decided to take this cluster and explore Gujarat market. So they uh, visited uh, various districts and various villages of Gujarat to understand the entire business model. Now, when we talk about, this is a small introduction of this project. Uh, it's, as we know, small enterprises have been the engines of economic growth across the world, and so do in India. 60% of employment comes in small scale industries, and they also contribute significantly in the exports from India. Now, Department of Science and Technology, Ministry of Science and Technology has initiated a program on innovation cluster with a vision to promote collaborative research, development, and commercialization among MSMEs. So MSME clusters to promote production of high value goods and services using the innovative route. Uh, this is the cluster, Samal Kha, which is, it is known as. There are, it is 75 kilometers from the national capital. And over the period of 60 years, this cluster has witnessed many ups and downs. So there are around 30 foundries, small scale units. They are manufacturing chaff cutter machines and they are exporting these machines to other countries also like Kenya, uh, uh, and Africa among the, and various countries in Africa. And this town is a central point of around 60 surrounding villages and is a big marketing center. It has a very big grain market with all the modern facilities as the largest uh, market for jiggery. This is the evolution of the machine, shaft cutter machine, started from 16th century till the 21st century. It started with a very basic machine but today due to innovation continuous innovation motor operated machines are in existence and uh, in india also states different states have different perception when it comes to uh, purchasing this machine so the farmer living in one state say for example in punjab they would prefer hand operated machine because they consider it as a routine exercise activity so they cut the shaft give it to the cattle so while cutting the shaft, it, it is also a routine for them to have their exercise, physical work. But when it comes to Gujarat state, 99% of the Gujarat in rural area has been electrified now. They, the, its electricity supply is regular. So Gujarati folks, the farmers, they, 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 they need more of a motor operated chaff cutter machine. Now, a university in Gujarat, Anand Agricultural University, has conducted a uh, study on cattle that if we provide cattle cutting the shaft into small pieces with a shaft cutter machine that it will become easy for the cattle to chew the grass the shaft and ultimately the milk productivity of the cattle increases by a certain percentage and these are the objectives of the study so we wanted to be able to analyze the current system and identify the gaps therein to understand from end users the reason for using and not using the shaft cutter machine so in other states, hand-operated chaff cutter machine is in demand. But in Gujarat, even the most of the farmers, when we visited, and I have personally visited around 65 villages in Gujarat state where I live, and I found that the demand is negligible because they feel that it is all about cut the chaff from the field and just put it in front of the cattle. And it becomes very difficult for the cattle to chew it properly, and it results in wastage. To analyze the reasons for low demand of chaff cutters in Gujarat, despite large cattle population, and to identify whether there is requirement for improvement in features of the existing product. So this is the research methodology. There are 13 district dairies in Gujarat. The ultimate boss of all these dairies is Anand Milk. 13 different districts, another district dairies are, uh, uh, are there. Every dairy is connected with more than 1,000 villages. So every morning, uh, the vans and the milk buses of these dairies, they go to the villages and they collect milk from the their district villages. And ultimately, uh, after their consumption, the reserve, the excess milk goes to uh, Anand and for, from there, the products are being made, which are being exported. So of course, uh, we have used non probability with conveniency sampling because when I visited the district dairies, I requested them to give me the address of nearby villages so that I can visit them easily and can get, get information. Uh, to gain more information about the scheme, we have referred 
uh, reports prepared by Micro Small and Medium Enterprise Foundation, New Delhi, uh, various brochures of job cutter manufacturers in Delhi and Gujarat, and government AFTP scheme guidelines. The primary data was being collected with the help of a structured questionnaire. And this is the process we have followed. We have reviewed the literature. We have re referred to the studies of various agricultural universities across the world and formulated the questionnaire. We collected the data, analyzed the data, which I'll show you in a while. And then uh, we presented our final report to the government of India. And this is Potter's five force analysis when it comes to uh, sharp cutter machine. You see, there are very few players in Gujarat. There is a demand for these machines, but uh, awareness is very low among people, and there is the, the concern is after sale services. So if they will trust the sailor, they will trust it, trust a sailor who is available there for after, after, for after sales services. Uh, uh, this is the supply chain of uh, uh, the dairy sec cluster in Gujarat, the dairy sector dairy supply chaff cutters to milk society and milk society passes it to the members. Similarly, when the, the milk society members, they deposit their milk, the milk which they milk from the cattle into the local village level society. And from there every morning, the milk one of the district dairy collects milk. And based on the fat content in the milk, the, uh, the, the, the farmer gets the payment. Now, these are the, this is, this is the map of Gujarat and you can see that red area is where we have a consolidated milk business in Gujarat. So the, these red, uh, this red area are the 13 district dairies and they cover the entire Gujarat when it comes to collection of the milk and then supplying the milk in pouches to the end user. So these are, this is the analysis of uh, each and every district dairy. Now, for example, uh, this particular dairy, they have they have approximately 1,148 villages associated with them. That means the farmers of more than 1,000 villages, they uh, supply milk to this district dairy. There are uh, more, like, more than 750,000 cattle available in the district. So, so but Amul, uh, this is Amul dairy and the biggest dairy. Uh, when we estimated demand after interacting with the uh, with the farmers at the village level, we could make, uh, make out that the demand is approximately 25,000 chaff cutters in Amul dairy only, that village is associated with Amul dairy only. Uh, since Gujarat is electrified, so the demand for motor operated chaff cutter is, uh, is more. Similarly, this is the analysis of all the dairies wherein the cumulative demand I would like to so show because I have been given the 15 minutes. Uh, so this is the cumulative table. So 13,073 villages of Gujarat, they supply milk to the various district dairies. And uh, approximate number of farmers who supply milk to the dairies is 28,35,000. And 1,45,000 chaff cutter demand most of them motor operated chaff cutter, that means electric chaff cutter demand we estimated. Uh, then, so this is this is the key observation. So dairies are keen to provide chaff and providing subsidy because why chaff cutter demand is sustainable in, in, in Gujarat? Because district dairies, they offer subsidy. So if the price is 10,000 rupees for a chaff cutter, the district dairy is ready to give a subsidy of 25%. And then there is another subsidy by the central government, which is another 25%. So a 10,000 rupee product ultimately reaches to the farmer in 5,000 rupees. The state of Punjab stands first in terms of supply of shop cutter. And that is the reason why the milk uh, business in Punjab is flourishing. The fat quality of Punjab's milk, the cattle who are in Punjab, their milk quality is of higher level, high quality. And uh, almost all the dairies of, are open to source and buy chaff cutters from outside Gujarat. But the problem is after sale services and there is a lack of awareness at the ground level, which is creating the problem. So uh, so these are the key observations from at the village level. As I mentioned, currently they used a simple grass cutter to cut the grass and they put it in front of the cattle. Cattle uh, chew it for some time and the rest is wastage. Now, in order to protect the wastage, in order to cut the grass in proper pieces so that it becomes easy for the cattle to digest, uh, this machine is useful. So that's how this entire entire project has shaped up. The purpose, the purpose is 
the purpose is so that ultimately the milk productivity uh, should increase. If it increases, it will help uh, the dairies, the Amul dairy, and uh, ultimately country, India, uh, to expand their milk export base and the other products which are made up of milk in other countries also. So that's, that is what I wanted to say. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, for catching the time and meeting the time, Dr. Bashan, for the, the interesting industry, sharing your industry experience concerning the dairy product. But you focus only on the role of the machine. You didn't focus on the climate change and the temperature and uh, the uncertainty that you are going to suffer. You prepare the machines, but you didn't take care that this is uh, uh, this is breathing and then it is will be a need to a certain care. Did you take into consideration the climate change in order to have a sustainable dairy product? Because uh, we we have a lot of prominent experience across the globe from the Saudi Arabia, where because as they did a brilliant experience in investing in R and D in keeping the cattle having a more breeding and have a more providing for the basic products that we're having for the near future, which is the milk. Uh, they are having a magnificent um, uh, result there, where they can provide. A huge uh, types of uh, milk comparing with the Egyptian market because of the technology and the R and D that they are investing there. So you you just focus only the machine, but you didn't take on other aspects concerning the R and D and the other things, which is very important. Uh, so two three things which I would like to add here. Uh, the problem uh, in the in the state where I have done this study is number one that per farmer cattle holding is low. So as compared to other countries uh, and other states, even in India, uh, the per farmer cattle holding is low in Gujarat state. And uh, so this is also this is also one aspect. Uh, second is the wastage. So my our focus in the study is more on the wastage. The wastage which is currently happening when it comes to offering the cattle the shaft, which it's chows, and most of the shaft goes waste which doesn't result in the productivity of the cattle. Uh, this is also one point which we are trying to raise in order to spread awareness regarding the usage of this machine. Now, as I mentioned initially in the presentation, uh, even in the states of India, there is an asymmetry. So for example, one state, Punjab, has a proper business flourishing, wherein the quality of milk is also of a higher level, wherein in Gujarat, there is a particular method of serving the grass to the cattle, which leads to more wastages. So these aspects are being considered in the study. But what you are suggesting, I'll definitely look into it and will make a part. We will make it a part of this. Thank you so much. I have another question from. Is there, there any question from the floor? I received one question. Uh, he used only two forces: the power of buyer and the power of supplier of the porter model. Why he ignored the other three forces? The question no, for no, I, I have actually, let me show, I have actually focused on the other also, but during, during in the presentation, I might have skipped that. Uh, I'll take you to that slide quickly. Uh, the power of buyer. And so here we have the bargaining power of buyer, bargaining power of uh, supplier, threat of substitute product or services. Uh, the rivalry, as I mentioned, there are very few players in the state currently. So others, uh, players, uh, manufacturers from other states, they have a good opportunity to enter in Gujarat market uh, and sell their product. The bargaining power of supply, since in Gujarat the demand is not that high, suppliers do not hold any bargaining power. Inputs are easily available and substitute inputs are not in picture. So no big role of suppliers. Substitute products, major competition is from the hand-operated axes. So farmers go cut the grass with the help of X and they put it in front of the cattle. Uh, there are one or two players, which are the major players in the Gujarat market. So other local manufacturing are very close to the market. Bargaining power of buyers, very few suppliers, limited options available for the buyers. No traders, market directly buying from the daily. So these are, this is the entire five quarters, five force analysis, which I prepared. But during the presentation, I focused only on the two aspects. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you, my dear friend, for sharing your knowledge and your experience in this industry. Thank you so much and wishing to see you in the near future in MSA near uh, conferences and workshop. Thank you, doctor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's go for uh, our prominent speakers. Uh, Last but not least, uh, Dr. Ahmed Al Amir. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Al Amir has joined Penal University London as a senior lecturer in accounting. 
He is uh, joining uh, Brunel Business School and work at Bradford University of Management, University of the West Scotland, UK. He graduated from Mansoor University and he have oh, extensively a number of internationally recognized uh, journals. Uh, good morning, Dr. Ahmed. Dr. Ahmed, you hear us? I think so. Maybe your mic is uh, silent and it, the mic is closed. And I think uh, Dr. Ahmed, the the camera as well is closed. Dr. Ahmed has he's presented his work at a number of national and international academic conferences, workshop and seminar. He have a research interest in the area of narrative disclosure. And he is going to share with us one of his recent papers that I asked him to reflect on it. <laughs> I, uh, I attract my attention. I love the paper. So he kindly going to share one of his recent top research, green gold or carbon breast. Good morning, Dr. Ahmed. I'm so happy that you find time. And I know the difference of time and they are squeezed of time. Thank you so much again. And the floor is yours. We have 15 minutes. Thank you so much. You uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. First of all, thank you very much for your invitation. It's really a pleasure to be among uh, you online. So today I will quickly uh, present uh, my paper about green gold or carbon paste. Uh, no, uh, this paper is around the cryptocurrencies uh, trading and the other cryptocurrencies trading uh, add uh, environmental value or uh, maybe has adverse impact on uh, the environment. And uh, to examine this, we choose two SDGs. The first one is uh, uh, about clear water management and second one about carbon emission. So just a quick introduction. Uh, as you know, uh, as individuals who have a great impact or uh, impacted by global warming and the climate change, and also uh, a lot of research uh, shows that humans affect our natural capital negatively. Uh, this ha uh, has a long term impact on our economies and uh, the natural environment. Uh, to handle this issue by companies, uh, recently we hear about green investment and the green finance. And this is emerging topic, which is a sustainable financial model that not only provides financial returns, but also supports environmental and social benefits. Uh, in this regard, also, we have some new technologies, uh, which under the umbrella of fintech, financial technology, such as cryptocurrencies and the blockchain technologies. And those are reshaping the financial industry with their decentralization, transparency, and security features. So United Nation, uh, Nation Agenda was introduced as a framework for sustainability to safeguard the environment and to guarantee that everyone uh, life in peace and prosperity by 2030. Uh, the sustainable development goals include 17 goals and 169 targets. And all, uh, all uh, countries in, uh, incorporate in this agenda. Uh, so what is the link between FinTech and uh, environmental SDGs? So uh, as you know, in, uh, innovative technology has a macroeconomic impact on nation's viability, where resources constrain the SDGs progress. Uh, also, we can see a lot of techniques related to water saving, which optimized by using uh, advanced techniques like Internet of Things solution, and also uh, those techniques lead to uh, less lakes and uh, a better track and more measurable progress toward the SDG. And here, when we speak about water saving, this is SDG six. Also, uh, we can see a lot of initiatives and the products with labeling green products where uh, 
also buyers can instruct suppliers to keep the number of liters below a certain level at the industry scale. So uh, our study uh, address the ongoing debate regarding the environmental implication of cryptocurrencies. Uh, specifically, we investigate the impact of Bitcoin uh, trading on water sanitation, sanitation, which is SDG 6 and the climate action SDG 13. So as a background, uh, we can see a huge uh, move toward several regulations and the policies related to cryptocurrencies in general and the green cryptocurrencies. And as you know, cryptocurrencies market uh, exceed $2 trillion by 2022. Uh, we have two different views about cryptocurrencies. So the United States integrates cryptocurrencies into its legal framework, acknowledging their economic potential and the risks. On the other hand, uh, China strict uh, ban on cryptocurrency and the uh, mining. This impact over 90% of global mining capacity lead to shutdown, reallocation, and the reduction in global mining activities, contributing to the semiconductor shortage. Uh, I think the voice is not uh, clear. Maybe the connections. You hear me, doctor? Yeah, no. okay, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. So uh, also the, the EU introduced uh, the market in crypto assets regulations in 23. Uh, Singapore and Japan also have also implemented robust regulatory frameworks recognizing digital currencies under existing financial laws. So despite varying approaches, most countries have strengthened controls over anti-money laundering and competing the financial of tourism using cryptocurrencies. Uh, so the problem here, uh, criticism based on analytical intelligence raised by evaluation studies, reviews, non-governmental organizations, reports, and those reports shows that mining in cryptocurrencies increase uh, energy use and this raises a lot of concerns, ecological concerns related to cryptocurrencies. So there is here a huge gap between intention of cryptocurrencies and the actual practices. Uh, also, we can see that environmental and social SDGs are less important than profit in some companies. And uh, again, the actual stats Stats show that 80% only uh, worldwide adopt environmental goals. So uh, most of SDGs are directly or indirectly related to sustainable green energy. Uh, so uh, in our research, we try to link uh, cryptocurrency trading and the mining with uh, energy efficiency and also water sanitization. So the research question here, what is the impact of Bitcoin on attaining SDG 6, which we, we measure it using uh, water management? And what is the impact of Bitcoin trading on attaining SDG 13? And we measure it by carbon emission. So to quickly uh, mention our methodology, uh, so uh, we, we collect our Bitcoin trading uh, data from uh, coin.dance website and uh, the SDG data related to uh, sustainability uh, development goals uh, from World Bank database and uh, the micro, uh, uh, micro data also we collect it from World Bank and the final sample contain 256 observations from 32 developed and developing countries.
to summarize our results, we, we found that uh, Bitcoin mining uh, uh, and the trading has a positive impact on SDG6 index. Uh, this lead to uh, improvement in water management. However, our results shows that Bitcoin also increase uh, carbon emission, uh, which lead to a negative impact on SDG 13. So our recommendations, uh, uh, first of all, other aspects of environmental sustainability are recommended to be examined, including uh, blue accounting, uh, more is investigations of other non-environmental SDGs affected by digitalization, such as education, poverty rates, health and well-being, uh, and hunger are recommended as well. We found uh, a huge gap in the literature that link uh, cryptocurrencies and uh, fintech with those variables. At the firm level also, this study suggest that environmental sustainability in reporting digital technologies and the cryptocurrencies as well as their impact on firm should be studied. Thank you very much for your time. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much for accepting sharing the paper and what is one of the top paper and recent 2024, if I'm correct? Yeah. Yes, and it is very interesting and how you link the macro variables with the SDGs, especially SDG 6. And uh, it is very interesting as well. I was wondering, is it suitable to measure SDGs 6 by which measure? What are the variables that you use it? Uh, water sanitization. It was available in the World Bank. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a question? We have a question? We have one question. Hi. Um, I'm so happy when um, uh, in the opening speeches yesterday, we discussed and touched most of the topics that were covered today. So uh, it's really relevant research, research that we are going to use and research that uh, has just started. So thank you for being uh, novel and proactive and looking at uh, cryptocurrencies uh, influencing um, reporting as the gist. as we were speaking yesterday that uh, and you as well that um, uh, cryptocurrencies uh, and, and any type of digital tools that we are going to um, adapt more in in future will actually influence uh, the way how we think, live, but also the um, uh, resources that are related to them, and especially in this respect, uh, the electricity. So I was even wondering, as you were speaking, whether the uh companies uh, that uh, are standing behind the cryptocurrencies that in future would actually be able to declare that uh, in their process of offering uh, this as a service they would uh, be able to say uh hello uh, we have used electricity from re renewable resources and our products are environmentally friendly what do you think so first, first of all, thank you very much for this uh, interesting question. Uh, actually, uh, companies that issue uh, cryptocurrencies now offer new products and uh, they label it with green cryptocurrencies. Those cryptocurrencies uh, reduce less uh, carbon emission. So actually, we are in process now to see those companies issue uh, environmental friendly cryptocurrencies. Yes, I do agree. But uh, are we really sure that the green really stands for green? This is what I'm saying, that we really need to have a system behind and ensure that their proclaiming of their service as green is really green and not um, part of the greenwashing, uh, basically, that is going on at the moment. You understand what, where, where, what I'm uh, thinking? Yeah. So uh, actually, I have a master student who did their master related to green cryptocurrencies. And they, in their dissertation, they shows some statistics related to carbon emission, related to traditional cryptocurrencies and the green 
new cryptocurrencies and they show that there is a huge uh, reduction in carbon emission between both uh, cryptocurrencies. Thank you. We have a question from the floor, please. Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Professor Dr. Abir Rajdan, you have a question, please, you can ask. The mic is working. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is a very interesting topic, Dr. Ahmad. Thank you for the excellent presentation. First of all, I might ask you how many countries you applied your research on. I didn't catch. I'm so sorry, I didn't catch. And 30, 32 countries. 32. Did you cluster them? Because if we are talking about the two things of United States and China, it depends on the water. And I didn't catch what water stress index. So water stress index will determine. So we are with or against Bitcoin according to the country level. And my other question is that if you cluster them about lower middle income or poor countries, where, where the financial development level? Could I think you are taking decision to go for Bitcoin or not? It depends on the financial level. If you are lower, you don't, you don't have a Bitcoin. So I think the debate is between China and the United States and depends on the water. So that's my questions. And I didn't get exactly, are we with or against? Because you said Bitcoin is okay for water, but it's bad for carbon emission. And all this SDG is about lowering the level or reducing the level of CO2. Okay, it's very harmful for growth. So I didn't catch exactly what's the exact recommendations of your research. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Thank you very much. So in the full paper, you will find that we address your point and it was also reviewers comment as well. So uh, we address this point by uh, uh, divide our sample to develop the developing countries and also based on the continents. Uh, and we found the huge differences between uh, those uh, sub samples. So uh, we found that in developed countries, they, they have positive impact on water and the less impact on energy consumption. However, in developing countries, we will find all the negative points. So we will we find that there is no significant impact on uh, water, but there is significant impact on carbon emission. Okay. And this is why your next point is very important. Uh, there is difference, uh, different practices between developed and the developing countries. And actually we suggest uh, as a future research to examine this point. And also uh, from the comment earlier, you can see that there is huge uh, move toward the green cryptocurrencies. Even Bitcoin now, they try to reduce uh, the mining procedures to reduce the uh, carbon emission as well. Thank you so much for your reply. I, I think that you will be of the prominent and the, the master papers uh, that people will follow and develop upon it. I have one last question, Dr. Ahmed from Ellen. Uh, it's not a question, it's just a comment uh, uh, where you mentioned that there is an influence in water. You can also connect it maybe with the new trend, blue economy because we're all talking about green, but now everyone starts talking about blue economy. So where there is an influence on the water, it can also be used in that area. But it was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Last question. You have last question. Okay. Your paper attract the audience. They didn't want to go to the break and they stay and ask you. Okay. Last question. Good morning, doctor. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding a uh, new cryptocurrency uh, which uh, created in, uh, I believe, uh, 2020 called uh, Bycoin or by Network. They are using a new mining uh, technique, which is an application on the mobile phones that you can mine uh, each day uh, by visiting the application once, once a day. Uh, and it works for mining for 24 hours. Then you repeat the uh, the mining session through visiting the application. Do you think such technique can reduce the carbon emissions? I, I believe so. So as I mentioned, there is a lot of new techniques now to mining cryptocurrencies, which will limit carbon emission and reduce it. Uh, however, I, I have limited knowledge actually about this type of cryptocurrency so i am not sure and I, I i will not able to answer it fully thank you 
<laughs> thank you so much, Doctor. And I think that we will have a collaboration so soon in the near future, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you for your interesting and beautiful presentation. And thank all the audience and all the speakers today. We have five international speakers, starting from United States to UK to India and Spain. So we have a very interesting speaker. I wish that you enjoy the session today. And then we are going to close the session now and go for the break. And then the coming section, session one, two, and three, is going to start at 12. At 12. Thank you so much, all of you, and see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Sit, sit. So we'll take a picture. Are you there?